All right. Think we're good. Yeah. Sheila, we're back. I know. We're back. <laughs> and we're together. Yay. This is so nice. I know. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong camera. There we go. Thank you for joining us. We are in like a, an official studio sort of thing. Uh, our, our libraries are uh, investing in, in Twitch and uh, making this a, a cool and different experience. So we're so excited to test out this setup. Uh, see some folks. Oh, there's our moderator already. Uh, Claire, thank you Hi, Claire, for thanks. all the support and joining us uh, as the moderator. Um, if you're watching, we welcome you to, uh, to chat. We can uh, see everything you're saying and we're happy to take comments and questions and just discuss. Uh, where do we start? What is reproducibility? Uh, I don't know. You, you tell me. Okay. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons that we're doing this is that um, we're excited about the, the breadth of things that are happening in the big world of open science and reproducibility, right? One of those things that's happening uh, is the reproducibility initiative uh, from our friends at, at Oxford University and uh, all around the world now. Um, journal clubs popping up. Um, it, so the, the flavor of that program that we've, did, that we've started here was uh, Open Science and Reproducibility Discussion Series. Yes. Uh, streaming on Twitch. We had a great time in, in February. Um, uh, our moderator may have the link to our GitHub repo, but the uh, resources and uh, topics that we covered were all there. Um, so, yeah, reproducibility. Yep. And now we're back doing it again. Yeah. So this is like the summer edition um, and we're focusing on like actually doing open science. So I'm going to do some demos today, um, show you what it looks like when I do open science. Um, and then we have some other topics we'll talk about too. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we thought, or I, I especially thought it was important because I, I tend to be, or I, I always am and gravitate toward being a, a topics and issues person. So I just want to like think in the sky and what are these ideas and how do we deal with them um and one thing we meant to get to in the spring was some what how do you do this what does it look like to be an open scientist especially because we keep hearing from governments and funders and um, professional associations that one of the ways into this kind of work is through training uh, people just need to know how to do this kind of stuff and then the culture change and behavior change will happen after that so that's uh, part of the reason that we wanted to just, let's just show. Let's just show what open science looks like. Uh, before we get to that, uh, the, the, the T thread that I wanted to take us on, and actually, um, yeah, we'll start with mine and then we should talk about your idea for what we do after this, but um, is sweet tea. So w we live in North Carolina uh, sweet tea is traditionally considered a, uh, a, a southern thing. Um, are you a fan of sweet tea? <laughs> well, I'm from New York, so I will admit that I don't actually <laughs> like sweet tea very much. I'm very much a unsweet tea person. <laughs> so. Sacrilege. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I feel like whenever I ask for unsweet tea, tea here in North Carolina I get that like look like you're not from around here yes <laughs> so yes and I have an opposite story so I uh, from Florida but sort of in the southern part of Florida uh, in Tallahassee uh, spent a lot of time there and then moved to New York City so the first place that we went out to eat um, some you know random restaurant on, on a corner somewhere and I ordered a tea expecting that it would be a sweet tea because of course that's when you order a tea that's what you get in Tallahassee or Raleigh or Charleston or wherever um, and so I order a tea they brought it to the table and I did the thing where you like <laughs> and like I didn't actually spit it all over but I was like the shock of, of non flavor in my mouth when there was no sweetness and then I, I, I didn't it didn't even compute so I asked the the, uh, the waiter or waitress I said um, this is this isn't sweet, and they're like, oh, yeah. Do do you want some sugar? <laughs> and then it hit me that oh wait, when you order tea here, it doesn't mean sweet tea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You definitely have to specify. Right. So I feel like even when I go back home to New York, I still am like, unsweet tea, <laughs> please. 
Yeah. But I do like lemonade and iced tea mm-hmm. mixed together. The Arnold Palmer. So that's kind of like a happy medium. Yeah. I think. Yeah, and then uh, more more lately for me when I'll um, order a, a tea at a restaurant here, I'll ask for half and half, oh, okay. sweet and unsweet. Because typically the, the sweet tea is very sweet, and then if you can kind of um, water it down with some unsweet, it's a nice medium. Do you know, like, what the ratio of sugar to water <laughs> is for, like, official sweet tea? <laughs> um, is it, like, a cup to, like, no, but, a okay, couple so liters? I don't think there is an official, but I'm thinking of when my mother-in-law makes it, and they live in a town south of um, Tallahassee. It's like a little pan on the on the. Can you see this? A little, <laughs> little pan on the oven, you know, with like five tea bags, uh-huh. probably three cups of water, okay, and probably two cups of sugar, okay, and then that gets poured into a big, uh, you know, a, a pitcher, and then add water added to that, okay. So it's pretty. Sweet. It's close, water to sugar okay. ratio. Yeah, fifty okay. fifty. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. But so, I do love iced tea. Generally. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Like, yeah. cold tea. Yeah. And hot tea. Like, both are fine. Yeah. So. I'm always curious. I don't know if anyone is uh, viewing or uh, there's, uh, of course, many of our colleagues in the in the UK and, and countries in Europe. <laughs> I, f- I feel like um, even talking about iced or sweet tea is, like, something that would not be talked about on the other side of the pond. Do you know? Yeah, I don't. I know definitely iced tea is a thing in Japan Mm. because they sell it in like the convenience stores Mm. and you can actually buy a bottle of like some of the vending machines will like give you hot like a bottle plastic bottle (laughs) of hot like um like milk tea huh yeah and you have to kind of like it's hot. <laughs> Sometimes it's in like metal cans, so it's like really hot. Um, but I don't know. I haven't ever, I haven't ever been to the UK. Oh yeah, that's so right. That that's our uh, yeah, like our um, the when we take the the show when the uh, open science and reproducibility goes on a, on our tour, we're going to the UK, UK, Amsterdam, Japan. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so le- leaning forward a little bit, when we sat down, Sheila, you mentioned there's a place. So we've mentioned Global Village, our favorite um, local um, coffee tea shop across the street here. Um, I forget that there's other restaurants right along Hillsborough Street here by NC State. Um, and there's a boba tea place. Yeah. That's not new. It's been there a little while. Yeah, like a year. Oh, and so, a half so, so new. Yeah, I think it was pre pandemic. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, so I think that we should, well, well, we'll probably go get it after we're done here, but then that should be our, our tea talk for next time is, yeah. is boba. Yeah, that sounds the, great. The, the wider world of, yep. of teas. Especially because you can get it iced or oh, yeah. slushy or whatever. So many or options. Hot. Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. Well, uh, w- welcoming you all to comment on your thoughts on sweet and or iced uh, tea in the chat yeah your opinion we need please. your opinion we need to know if we're on um on track here or not um so let's uh let's show some op- oh yeah we have our fancy switcher thing here yeah um let's show some open science how do you, how do you want to start yeah so i guess the first thing we can start i'll start sharing go ahead let's hope oh it's working yay okay Um, So I think the first thing, like, I wanted to mention was that, like, to be an, well, we've talked about this a lot, but, like, open science, I feel, like, I agree with what Micah believes, which is that open science is, like, the process. I mean, we always talk about, like, you know, like a preprint. That's an example of, like, an output that is open but I think it's like, you know, you're also thinking about like, how are you getting to that preprint or how are you getting to that data mm-hmm. repository that's open? So, and I also often think about, you know, like 
I can't do everything at once. Like a lot of like good goal setting techniques. It's like you don't want to like pile on all the expectations like right off the bat. You want to kind of like chip away at it. So like maybe this project you're going to have this particular goal and then the next project you'll build on to that say like okay this first project maybe I'm just going to post the preprint mm -hmm. next project mm -hmm. I'm actually going to try to like start um, like you know putting my code up and my data up and posting a preprint and then the next project after that I'm going to try to get my collaborators to also like participate in it you know so you're kind of like building on each iteration yeah. um, and like eventually like the ideal is that like the whole process will be open you know as you progress through your career and have different projects but yeah, yeah just like chipping away um, so I think one thing that I also wanted to mention is that it helps to have like some sort of structure that you have that's consistent across your projects. And so I like to use this um, like project template that I kind of came up with. So if I'm starting a new project, um, I'm trying to make it bigger no nope, I can't make it bigger so I hope everyone can see that but um, I can also say so I have this project template folder and then in that folder I have like an administration folder an analysis folder a readings folder a to be filed folder folder and a mm -hmm. write-up folder mm -hmm. um, and then I basically will like over the course of my project like organize the project that way yeah. um, and then in the so like in the administration folder, I'll start with that one, uh, like I have conferences, presentations, and proposals. Mm. Um, and then, you know, the list could go on. Like if you have a budget, you might want to have like a budget folder, stuff like that. Staffing. Hiring, Staffing, yeah. yeah. Uh, undergrads or researchers. Yes. Yeah. Yep, yep, stuff like that. Mm. Um, and then analysis folder, I would have data, figures, functions, um, and then your different scripts and then to be sorted and sometimes to be honest like I often kind of struggle a little bit with the analysis folder because I try to keep on my computer I try to keep like all my github repositories in one directory mm -hmm. so a lot of times like within that github directory I have like a particular project and that project has like data and code in it so sometimes I start um, in this analysis folder and then I eventually like transition into the GitHub folder um, that I'm working from. But you could still keep like, you know, like if you had figures that you were working on, um, I don't know, like if you had to actually create a figure from scratch using like Inkscape or Photoshop or something like that, this might be like a good place to put those types of things or like presentations that you're giving mm -hmm. to your um, supervisor or colleagues can keep that in the before, analysis. Before you click, can I ask functions? Oh, so functions, this is basically a type of uh, code, like, but it's very specific. So it'd be like a script, a coding script that you've written that has a very specific, uh, like, goal. Mm. Um, so, for example, um, I have been doing a lot of work with the data at the state climate office. And so I wrote a function that will, I put in like an input into that function, the code, mm -hmm. and then it will spit out like the data set that I want. Okay. But whatever calculations I'm doing to actually grab the data and get it, that's all happening um, behind the scenes in this like function script so they're kind of like specific to your project um, but have like some kind of steps that you're trying to like automate almost okay. that sure. you could put them in your script but if you're gonna use them like over and over again sometimes it's better to create like a function hmm. and people will call that like functionalizing your code hmm. um, 
so that you're not just like copy pasting the same code in your script over okay. and over again. You're just using like a function and that's going and grabbing like the code from a different place. And so I'll tend to keep those in like a folder just so I know um, that's where they are. Cool. And then readings, oops, readings, that would be like any papers that you find um, or your supervisor or <laughs> colleagues send you that you should read that's like pertinent to, or reports that are pertinent to that particular can, project. Can, uh, because I'm a librarian and <laughs> I'm very curious, <laughs> can I ask, have you, have you ever or um, would you consider using citation management software rather, or, or, or is that part of your workflow here for the reading specifically? Yeah, I think ten, what I typically tend to do is I'll like dump stuff into that readings folder and then when I'm ready to start writing something up, then I'll use something like Zotero mm -hmm. or Mendeley or and To and help you manage citations. To help manage yeah. citations. Okay. Okay. But I do like Zotero because it also helps you manage like the files on your computer too. Yeah, that, so that's um, how the, I use it. Yeah. Almost not the not the opposite way you do, but like the primary thing that I use Zotero for is organizing readings that I may do. Yeah, and then the ones that I do and then um, need to use for citations or bibliography, I sort of move them to a su okay. subfolder. Okay. Anyway, okay. I'm just, I'm just yeah, curious. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, we had a question. Did you come up with this folder? Oh. So I'm gonna, so I didn't come up with it. It's actually, um, there was a friend of mine from Our Ladies RTP, mm -hmm. who's actually like a stats faculty member at Duke. And she went to this workshop that was put on by someone, and I don't know, he has a whole book about, I think it's like a Stata centric book. Um, and I will be sure to put that on the um, repository that Claire linked to earlier in the chat. Um, but he had recommended like this particular project template and my, my friend was talking about it and how she thought it was like a really good idea. And I actually never read the book, but I was like, that's a really good idea. I can easily do that. So I sort of just made this template based on like a quick conversation with her. Yeah, but that's good. That's um, a lot of um, like a, a relatively new area in, in libraries and supporting research is what we call data management. And one of those first things that we talk about is file management, like put your things in, a, in, a, in an order on your computer that makes sense. Yeah. And then there's all the other stuff of um, uh, like the data itself, mm -hmm. the, the code, um, and then thinking about how much of this needs to be accessible to reproduce the work. Anyway, so yeah. what you're talking about is what we like to teach and call sort of fi file management for effective data management. Yeah, I feel like I definitely learned the hard way because, I don't know, there's like this funny, I think it's an XKCD comic where, or no, it's PhD comics, <laughs> and it's like... One of the two. It's like, he has this like folder, and in it, it's like, thesis, final, and then it's yeah. like, thesis, <laughs> final, final, thesis, final, ah, uh, crap, I'm never going to finish this thesis, or yeah. like some like Final ridiculous. with advisor comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I feel like that was definitely <laughs> me, like, in grad school. And then I was just like, I got to get, like, a handle on this. And mm. so I'm also, like, I love organizing things. I've, like, always done that. <laughs> like, I'm the kind of person that, like, as a kid, I would, like, sit and organize my, like, bead collection or uh. something like that, you know. So Or, like, my button collection yeah, yeah, or yeah. something. So I'm, like, totally up for organizing. So I think that also is something I just think about a lot. So this is kind of why. That's, that's why yeah. we're friends. <laughs> uh, Technobotanist has a really good question here. Is a readme stored in a standard place within an open science Git? Are they necessary and advisable? So I guess short answer, yes, they're necessary and advisable. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I tend to keep them right in the main, like right in the main part of the readme. But I can actually show an example. Um, so I was going to jump to the, so this is a, oops, let me, 
So this is a, a repository that I'm currently working on. And I'll just go down. So in the main folder, this has a readme file. And I haven't gotten to this yet. But this is basically where I would spell out like the who, what, when, where, why, and like talk about each specific script, what it does, like what the data is, where, like what are the units, things like that. Um, and so I can kind of give you, so this is a newer repository that I'm still working on. Um, and this also kind of gives you an idea of how I would, so right now you can see here's like a functions folder. Mm -hmm. And if I click on that, these are these different functions that I've created. So I have a function that will get data, a function that will read the metadata, which mm -hmm. this function is actually a part of that one. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they're kind of like nested. Um, and then right now I actually have, I do have a data folder right now, but because this work isn't published yet and the data is kind of messy still, I actually have it ignored. Mm. So if you go into the git ignore, you can see like the data and the figures folder are currently being ignored. Mm. So I'm still tracking their changes or sorry, I'm not tracking their changes, but I'm still like working on them. But once I'm ready to like publish this, then I can actually remove these from the git ignore and then that will already, it'll automatically be like pushable to the internet. Nice. So um, it's there, it's just like GitHub isn't tracking or git isn't tracking it. Um, and then I have started numbering the orders of the different scripts that I do use to do this analysis. Um, this is just like a file that R creates for like a time zone. Um, and then here's the readme, which I will fill out. And then these, are, so you can see it's kind of like a work in progress. So all of these scripts here are things that I need to, to number, but I haven't gotten to like cleaning them up yet. Um, and so eventually basically all these files will be numbered so people can go through and say like, okay, this is what she did first. Hmm. This script is first, this script is next, so smart. you know, stuff like that. <laughs> so this, That's I can't good, take credit idea. for it. My friend, Sam Zipper and Tom Gloss, who are, um, so Sam is a faculty member at uh, the Kansas Geologic Survey and Tom uh, as a postdoc working with Sam, so they cool. were talking about numbering scripts, and that's I was a great like, idea. such a good idea, I'm going to do me, that. So let me take the readme question one step further. So you organize, you have a file structure on your laptop, mm -hmm. on, your, on your machine, um, and that's where things start, and then as you begin doing processing or analysis, pieces of it start to move to the GitHub repo, right? Yep. Um, one thing that, that I do that I'm curious about is um, I'll have a readme on my, um, on my desktop also okay. so I understand mm -hmm. what this thing, like okay. I think of it like an index or a table of contents, okay. right? Um, which is different I think than how lots of other people use readmes. But I would make sure that as soon as I move to primarily using GitHub that that readme is is there also so you don't necessarily have readme files on your um, desk on your laptop right because it's because it's only for you yeah you know what the file mm -hmm. structure is you know how it's yep. laid out but once things start to move to a public environment and yep. open environment then you that's where you add that clarity yep okay. exactly okay yep yeah, and so this is an example of like a fully fleshed out and published repository. So this is my first repository, <laughs> first public. <laughs> this is from work from my PhD. Um, and so um, there are already some things like I'm looking at this now and I never included like a citation file. So I would have included that. I, I do think I mentioned it in the readme, but now that I'm older, I would definitely include <laughs> that older and wiser. Um, but like, yeah, so these are, um, I think, I believe these text files here, that's actually the data. And then I have the scripts here. Uh, oh, sorry. And then I also included the raw data. So this might be the process data. Hmm. Um, and then this is kind of what, so 
this is like the who, what, when, where, why. And I believe I am going to quickly Google. So I, um, I used a template. Cornell. Yeah. <laughs> so I did my PhD at Cornell and they That's have this awesome. template that they um, hmm. like basically recommend that you use okay. if you don't know like what oops if you don't know what metadata language to use and so at the time I was just like I don't know I'll just you know use a readme so use their template um, so basically this has um, like what this repository is and then like who created it uh, where it was created and when and then like the licensing, all the all this information, it just goes like on and on. And so I did this include a citation. Yeah. Um, and like I guess that's another thing is like this all takes time. Yeah. But I like made sure to make time. Um, I would like recommend that you start doing this sooner than later and not waiting till the end, which is kind of what I did for this one. Mm -hmm. But like, and now my my supervisors all value like documentation so mm -hmm. i think that also helps if you encourage whoever you're supervising to document these types of things but then for each file i kind of explain what it is what it has in it what it's doing how it relates to other things and this is all like kind of written out in the template that's awesome so i just followed it and then talking about methods this is, um, I, I mean, like, things like I knew that you were my favorite open <laughs> science <laughs> superstar ever, but this kind of stuff is the stuff that I, <laughs> like, if I had a, in my entire career to advance open science, writing that out to that level of detail is really the stuff that's going to make, um, it's going to change pr tenure and promotion and, you know, like, start to value new kinds of products, of, like, that's... That's how it happens. Yeah. That's awesome. It definitely took a long time. Yeah, but I'm, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I also feel, I just feel better about, uh, you know, like this is like reproducible because mm -hmm. everything, like all the details are there. So let me ask one question. So you, so this was your first mm -hmm. um, reproducible uh, pro project. Yep. Um, how long has it been since you've looked at it? Or like since you did the, the, the project a couple years? Yeah, it looks like five. Five or years. Okay. I guess three years is the most recent update. And so I know you're, you're, you're just yeah. skimming it, but the only thing you've said that you would change now, looking back on this, is to add the software citation as a file itself, right? Yeah. You, so other than that, you think this thing is still pretty sound, like ca encapsulated as a research object, if it, you were add the citation, um, then it's still good. Yeah. That's I do great. think the one other thing that I would add now that I know more <laughs> is, like, I don't think I added, like, versions of the software mm -hmm. and versions oh, sure. of... Like, like I might what have, version of, R, of whatever you were using? Added, yeah, I might have added, like, the version of R, hmm. but I don't know if I added versions of particular R packages... And now there actually are a lot of tools like Docker or there's like our environment, like that package mm -hmm. that will actually like keep a copy of your working environment yeah, and right. then you can save that in your repository. And then so people know exactly yeah. what versions and can like reproduce exactly like what the environment you had when you did this work. It's awesome. So that's some those two things. Yeah, I would yeah, definitely yeah. Add. That, that's great. Um, what I, what, I, what I wanted to get at is, if you do this well, I think you put in the time. That there is, um, we were talking right before we started. A thing that I always think about is the scholarly record. How do we curate and maintain and um, enhance the scholarly record as an artifact of your work? Five years, you know, three five years old. This is still a pretty good representation as a. Um, a piece of the scholarly record. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So as I mentioned, like, so this was like my first 
repository that I like openly shared and so this is kind of me like okay I did that one thing the publication was not put up on a preprint I mean I could probably go back and do it now but at the time I didn't really know about preprints so I didn't end up doing that um, but then the next project I did which um, I also have a repository for I also I, that ended up actually going up because it was with the U.S. Forest Service. They have mm -hmm. their own, uh, like they maintain the copyright to the publication, so they're able to post it on their like tree search is what it's called. Yeah. Um, and so that one, I didn't actually have to post a preprint because it was already going to be like downloadable. Cool. Um, but then, you know, as I've progressed, I've been trying more and more um, to put the preprints up along with having the data and the code up. I think I've told you this a couple of times before, but oh, and, and Natalie knows this, and Natalie Nelson, our, our friend and colleague. Um, I was when, when I when I want to show an example of what open science looks like. Like this is great, and this is taking us to a, a deeper layer. But even just at a very um, at a top layer, I'll show your website because you have you know the paper title, and then. Here's the data, here's the project, mm -hmm. here's the published PDF. Yeah. Here, like being able to just see that, oh, there are different versions of things that all have made up mm -hmm. this thing that has some value to you in your career. Yeah. Um, that's been the clearest that I've seen to show this is what open science looks like at a really top surface level, and then this is a, a next level down. Yeah. So again, congratulations. It helps me stay organized. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it helps me because I'm like, wait, what did I do? Did that thing? Did, you know, or like someone will ask me, like, can I read the paper? And I'm like, yeah, just go to this project page. And it has everything, including mm -hmm. the paper, mm -hmm. like listed. Yeah. Um, cool. So one thing I also wanted to mention, which we've talked a lot about, is like, I. so the reason I use GitHub is because it works really well with this um, platform called Zenodo, which you can see here. So this repository actually has a DOI and is then citable. Um, and so if you click on this, let's see, um, it'll actually take you to like this longer, so Zenodo, which they, um, by saving the data and the code here, you're interfacing with GitHub, you're sharing a snapshot of your github repository and then they also maintain that they will keep um like this long term and i think they say like 20 years or something like that yeah. so you're also like by doing by using zenodo you have the citate you have the doi which is citable and you also can interface with github which is really very easy mm -hmm. And then you can also make sure that this data is going to be available for 20 years, which is like quite long. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think the, the, the standard, I have a friend who works more in data than I do, but we, we used to talk a lot and he said um, 10 years is forever in sort of digital, um, I don't want to say digital preservation because that's a really specific area of librarianship. Anyway, but ten, 10 years is sort of like the forever that we can count yeah. on. So. Zenodo, I, this is like my go-to recommendation for a, a general repository for everything. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that connector with, um, with GitHub is really amazing. Yep. Yeah. And I think, um, so in some cases, like if you are working with like huge data sets, like there is a file size limit to GitHub. Yep. So what you could do, there are also like so this, in this particular instance, I'm, you know, I'm basically saving a version of a repository, but you can also just save versions of like data sets mm -hmm. on Zenodo. So I haven't actually done that. I need to do that for a particular project, but, um, but right now it's saved on like NC State's drive, but if I leave NC State, it's no longer going to mm -hmm. be there. So can um, we sc scan down and like see, I want to see what this record looks like here. Yeah, so that so, just basically snapshots the mm -hmm. whole repository, right? Yep. And and grabs all the files? Yep. Nice. So yeah, there's a bunch of uh, microscope images um, and yeah, a bunch of Test other machines. calibration data. 
uh, stuff like that. Cool. So, yeah. Why did you feel, here we go into uh, topics and issues, why is a DOI valuable to you? You've mentioned that it, it makes something citable, but um, <laughs> some, uh, I'll say that also, and someone will say back to me, well, things are citable if they don't have a DOI. Mm-hmm. Right? Like we, we can cite a book, books don't have a DOI. Why did, why did it feel like a, having the DOI, especially for the GitHub repo, is valuable or, or necessary for you? Well, I think, I mean, a lot of it is, it's like, it feels more like official, I guess, if mm-hmm. it has a DOI. Yeah. Like, it's, and it's also trackable. Um, and Trackable, like, you mean these, those numbers right there? Yeah, so, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, like, I mean, as much as I, like, don't like that academia is like based on you know statistics like metrics and this is how it is and like i think as like an early career researcher like the more credit you can get for all the work you've done is like the better yeah so um i think and and i do think like the data is valuable and it could be valuable to other people so like being able to have easy access to that um i think that advances science too i I wholeheartedly agree (laughs) just just wanted to hear you say it (laughs) um what else was i gonna say yeah what was Um, the show okay so oh another thing so i wanted to also mention so this is where did that Oh, so this is that repository that I had just shown. Nope, that's the old one. Sorry for flipping back and forth here. Um, this is what everyone does with all their screens, so I'm sure it's Oh, <laughs> so this is that repository that I was saying I was working on now, and it's kind of like a work, it's still like a work in progress. So Nally and I, um, my postdoc advisor, we're still working on this paper. But one of the other cool things that I like about GitHub is they have this projects um, like platform. And so you can... It's like a, a Kanban board yeah. built in. To, so yeah. you can keep track of like what you have to do, what you're working on, and what you've done. Um, mm-hmm. And so this is basically me just like tracking issues for myself. But um, it's just really cool because you can like drag and drop things so like for example um so a lot of these things i've actually finished but like for this one i'm kind of still working on it so i can just drag it and drop it over here because i had forgotten to put it like in progress Mm -hmm. and these other things like um this one i didn't do yet but this one i did so i could actually like click on this and then it'll pop up here, and then I can close it yep. if I'm ready to do that. So that's helpful. Um, and then the other cool thing is that when you're making your commit messages, you can also uh, close items by tagging. So this says number one here. Maybe that make this a little better. So if I add like fixed number one to the commit message when I'm doing using Git it'll actually like interface with GitHub and then it'll actually move it to the done folder automatically and I won't have to do that. Yeah, yeah. So there are certain like verbs like fixed, finished, like I think there's a whole, I'll try to put that up on the repository too, but there's like a whole like Git verbs that will close different issues. So you can, by using that verb and the combination of like the hashtag with the number hmm. for a particular issue, you can close That's awesome. an issue. Um, uh, I had a question. Yeah, we have a great question Thank from you. our moderator and welcome others as well. Is there a good way to use a repository to credit other people on the project? Maybe contributors or a tagging system? I, I have an answer, but I'd love for you to start. Um, so I would... Oops, I would actually, uh, I guess this is what I would, I would just list, um, you know, like a citation. I guess you could, I don't have that here, but you could include like all the co-authors 
and then put you know their contact information or um like where they're coming from and things like that i don't know i'm interested to hear what you have to say yeah well so um uh these are all i think developing a new and new practices but um something that I've seen that I'm really excited about is you mentioned so having a, a readme file a citation file saying this is how you cite this thing and also what I've seen is people are starting to add a contributors file so okay. contributors.md or whatever that describes Sheila did this and then we start to get into like the, the credit taxonomy we talked mm -hmm. a little bit about with, with Cassidy back in, in February um, how can we accurately describe the labor that goes into a project like this and have it be sort of standardized right using mm -hmm. similar language across lots of disciplines and fields um, so yeah having a contributors file I can't, um, yeah I, I wish I had an example at the top of my hand but I, I feel like if we were to just I bet Julia Lowndes has um, has one somewhere um, but yeah, so a contributor's file that basically uses a standard. Yeah, here. Oh, this is how you would contribute. Yeah. They that but might, they might have it in there too. Sometimes it's in there. There might be just so many people that they. <laughs> this is ggplot. Yeah. 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 So this is how you would contribute. Yeah. But. Um, and then, like, with things like like GitHub having the contributors yeah. actually able to show up with their little faces there on the side is great. There's so many. But it doesn't necessarily describe exactly how or what or to what degree um, this person added something valuable. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's, it's, it's, a, it's an emerging practice, especially around open science, I think, to, add, to really be clear about um, in either the paper acknowledgements section, like I saw this at the end of your, oh, we'll get mm -hmm. to it in a second, but the end of your paper, or you do, you've done this more than a few times where you say, we all contributed to conceptualization, but yeah. I did methodology and you did review and writing. Um, this is, yeah, the credit taxonomy that, that Sheila's showing here is, is becoming more useful, I think. Yeah, and this is like a standardized a way to describe roles. Yeah, and so, so. The, the only issue, well, a issue I have with this is that this, those 14 contributor roles obviously don't capture everything that goes into a project and are very much built in the journal-based scientific mm -hmm. um, research. So it doesn't apply to a digital humanities project or to a historian. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess, so I've kind of been talking a lot about GitHub um, and Git. So yeah. Git is like a one of a couple different versioning like software. So keep how to keep track of versions of like code. <clears throat> and so I sort of flip back and forth. Um, so my tools aren't pulling up here, but sometimes if you look uh, our like our studio has like built in Git and GitHub functionality. And so I'll often use that. And another cool thing about our studio is you also have access to your terminal mm -hmm. through our studio. So I often will just use that terminal there. And so you can take a file. So this is an example. This is the readme that we're working on to develop the reproducibility uh, T. Um, talks and so I could add you know like versus <laughs> unsweet <laughs> Oops. and so now I've made like a change to that right and you can so it's like you know indicating in red that it's unsaved so I can save it and then I will typically say like okay what is the status and and git will tell me okay you've actually changed mm. something in this file yeah. um and so if i look so i've changed it and saved it um actually i'm gonna skip forward so i wanna let i wanna actually say like 
yes, I'm going to add this change and I'm going to commit it. Um, so that's kind of like after you've done a group of changes and you're ready to say like, this is good. I'm like ready to like, I'm ready for Git to like register this as a change. Mm -hmm. First you have to add. So first you have to basically like um, line up the change in GitHub and then you actually like commit them, which means you're saying like, yep, I'm like totally cool. These changes are great. Mm -hmm. um, so first you would type, I'm gonna actually make this bigger because I'm really think it's probably small. Uh, looks okay. Okay, so first you would type git add and then the actual file name and I just did autocomplete there so I add, I typed re and then tab and then that autocompleted. Um, and then I can hit enter and now if I type git status again you'll see it actually changed to green mm -hmm. and so that's how I know like okay it's ready to be committed and so then I can type git commit and I'm going to say read, read, oops, that me? Too many E's. Oops, thank you. <laughs> um, and then I will type a message. So I'm going to say added T versus text or some, some message that's like applicable. And then push enter. And what did I do? Oh, I spelled the file name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so it was actually like this, right? And then dot, dot md. Mm -hmm. And then enter. And now, oh, see, this is live coding for you. I forgot to say that I was going to add a message which is dash M and now it'll tell me, okay, you've changed one file and that's what you've done. Cool. Um, and then I can say git status, right? So now it's telling me, okay, so it's changed on your local computer, but now the repository online that it's connected to, that change hasn't been made on that repository. So that's the, your branch is ahead by blah, blah, blah. Yep. Yeah. And so we can actually go and look at, um, so if I refresh this page, you'll see like the text that I added isn't here yet. And that's because I haven't synced like what's on my local computer to like the internet. And so to do that, you would type git push. And then it'll say, okay, we're pushing and it takes some time. And then you can actually go here and refresh and you can see, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you want to see, like you want to go back and see like what actually all did you do, you can look at the history and it'll tell you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There it is. what exactly you did. So I click on that and it'll say like, oh, you added this text to line 21. Um, and so you can see that. And then you can also like go backwards if you mess stuff up. If I say like, I don't actually want this, you can go. That's, so, why, that's why version control is so valuable here, right? Yep. Okay, so here's the, here's the mega question. D does one have to um, be competent with Git, GitHub, R, Python, etc., to be an open scientist? I don't think so. I think it's part of, uh, like, it's part of, like, the skill set. Like, mm -hmm. if you're not coding, I don't think there, like, I don't see, like, a good way. I mean, I guess you could be versioning, like, Word documents mm -hmm. and things like that. But I think it's like one piece. I think if you can take whatever science or like if even if you're not in the sciences, like whatever you're doing and like make it more transparent in some way right, or right, make right. it reproducible in some way, right. I think that counts. Mm. So, uh, so. Th this gets back to how, how we were talking about in the spring that the principles are the same. So transparency is a principle. Um, how you practice that, like you've just shown us, effective documentation, um, 
uh, having a clear process or how you do this, that's your version of transparency, right? Yep. And that works for your work and it makes sense for your field. Yep. But transparency would look different for a sociologist or for yep. a physicist. Yep. Or, yeah, okay. Or, yeah, like, I mean, yeah, this is something I wanted to talk about. Like, if you, if you are, you know, you have privacy concerns with the data that you collect, obviously you can't share some things um, yep. to protect folks privacy so like there are some things like you still will be able to share like you'll still be able to share like how you analyze the data right right and like the process you took and like the assumptions and justifications that you made while you're analyzing Hmm. um you could even say like i use this software and it was this version you know like that type of thing you can still like be open about those details um, even if you can't share like the actual data. Yeah. 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 There's a, a phrase that I love that everyone who knows me has heard me say before, but uh, as open as possible, as close as necessary, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, and I think that that is um, really helpful for people who feel, who, who want to practice openness, but feel constricted by, you know, um, the structure of academia mm-hmm. or where they're at in their career or the type of work that they're doing. Yep. I can't share all this information about all these people. Yep. How can I still be an open scientist? Yep. Uh, you share what you can. Yeah. Or, like, yeah, I could also say, like, in some cases, collaborators won't want to be as open. Not, not Micah. <laughs> but, like, other collaborators I've had. Like, they are more hesitant, you know, to share early stages of analysis and things like that. Um so in that case, it's like, okay, like, I get that, but I'm going to advocate, like, when we actually publish this, that we are then setting up, like, a well-documented repository so people can see, you know, what happened yeah. Yeah, yeah. during the analysis. Yep. That's awesome. Um, and actually, so some friends and I have been working on... Um, so we kind of talked a little bit about preprints. So I'm going to, I guess... I, I won't mention what we've been working on, but I'll just quickly jump. So we kind of talked about um, preprints, and I wanted to show... So Micah and I... So we've been... We actually just published a preprint mm-hmm. on a paper that hopefully we'll talk about more in August. Um, and so I kind of wanted to just share... So this... We're using the Earth Archive. There's lots of other non for profit preprint servers out there Mm -hmm. um but this is like a great way to help you like i like it because as an early career scientist like i maintain control of the publishing process by posting a preprint so and i can say like you know this has been submitted but or it's in review or whatever um but you know you can actually see like what we've written and like the status of it if you wanted to Um, And then you can update it as things change in the publication process, like it gets accepted or something like that. Yeah. Um, And and this this one's a good example of of what a preprint can do because this is our our version. We're in the middle of, uh, you know, got some reviews and editorial comments. So the version that, that we hope will be published will be different than this, maybe not significantly different, but there will be some some changes. Yeah. Um, But it was still important for us to have the version that we um, submitted available to start the conversation about, um, yeah, researchers and developing web apps. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and the other cool thing that I've actually also benefited from is, like, by posting the preprint, um, you can actually track, like, how many people are viewing Mm -hmm. and downloading your preprints. So that's also been helpful. Like, for example, this paper here... um, it had to go through, like, it was a review paper, so I actually had to get permission to submit the full paper Mm -hmm. from the journal. And so I actually used um, the number of views and downloads to, like, justify Mm -hmm, that it would would be valuable for the journal to submit in the cover letter. Awesome. So I think, like, it's definitely helpful to do that. Yeah, this is cool to see because so... uh, I'm an advocate of preprints, advocate of sharing research often and, and early, but I've never seen the back end of Earth Archive. Um, 
I, there are other disciplinary archives that I pay attention to, but this is one that recently um, switched platforms, right? Can you show the um, how they tabula or how they retained the? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so it switched platforms. Yep. But so, the people behind it, who's the California Digital Library, our friends in, uh, over there, found a way to keep the metrics from the previous platform also, yep. which is super cool. Yeah, so this paper I had actually submitted as a preprint when Earth Archive was under another this other open science framework pr platform. Yep. And so um, they actually, so in the metadata for the paper, it's not labeled that well, but this number um, is actually the number of downloads that had been the number of downloads for this preprint before the switch. Mm -hmm. So I kind of figured that out because I knew what it like what it was mm -hmm. about. And then I saw that they had kept this number and I had also talked to some of the folks when they were doing the switch and I was like, is that recorded somewhere? And they're like, it should be in the metadata. So it's not really like labeled very well, but I know like that's what that number is. Yeah, so when I add it together with this, um, yeah, the Janeway like system, I can. You get the full tally. number. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. And then, yeah, I can see, you know, the different version so this paper I had a lot of different versions mm. so yeah so you can see like the first version um was submitted in 2018 um and then a bunch of other changes throughout yeah so and then people can comment on it stuff like that so, so this, this is what a preprint back end looks like yep Cool. Um, and so then oh. the other, we're, we're, we're almost running at our hour. Time. What else yeah. do you want to show? Go, the go, go. one last thing is, um, <laughs> so I guess for hydrologists, oh, yeah. we've been working on this paper called a hydrologist guide to open science. And so I'm a hydrologist. So we've been trying to, um, work on basically like a practical guide to doing open hydrology. And so this paper is actually posted as a preprint too, but we have a website. Um, it's open-hydrology.github.io. And so you can actually read the paper. There's a link and you can just Google. So it is on, up on Earth Archive, but in this paper, like we really wanted it to be very practical. So we actually have like an appendix that talks about different scenarios and like how, like, so like typical scenarios people could uh, like get into with regards to doing open science or open hydrology mm -hmm. and like brain helping to facilitate brainstorms you know you could read this paper in like a journal club or something and help yeah, to facilitate yeah. discussions like how would we if this happened like how would we get out of it or rectify it right or or, how, or what what decision is possible to make mm -hmm. for toward the end of openness yep yeah, the uh, I, I, I love this. I think this is awesome for two reasons. One is practical, right? Because lots of people really just yeah yeah. Yeah. So yeah. here is the. Lots of people really just need to um, some clues, right? If yeah. if this, then here's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, the other reason I really like this is I I think a future for open. So we we've you know we're what 15, 20 years into the open movement, open research movement. Um, there's been lots of effort to do this at a national scale or at a funder scale or at an institutional scale. I think that disciplinary approaches like open hydrology um, are the, the next horizon. Saying, okay, we, we understand the big landscape, we understand how uh, principle, uh, core principles, this is what it looks like in hydrology, yeah. this is what it looks like in high energy physics, this is what it looks like in um, social theory or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I, I imagine like these challenges would definitely change by discipline. Like I just, I don't know if you knew this, but like someone was telling me recently in like, and I think it was like um, some biology subfield, how like some of the journals now won't let you post a preprint 
that is like similar to the actually published preprint or this is this would be a post print so they're like yeah. trying to like yeah. retain <laughs> the final version so i was like okay in that situation i would have no idea what to do like i haven't yeah. thought about that but but i think like each field will have its own unique challenges maybe some will be similar like getting funding <laughs> for yeah. open access publishing yeah um yeah. Yeah. those things will be you know similar between fields but there are i'm sure other issues that will come up that are very unique to a specific field that's right that's right um and the uh in our concluding comments here i'll say that hopefully uh, oh yeah let's flip back let's flip back there we are um Hope, or my, my hope and my work is that libraries will always be a place where what, whatever discipline you're, you're representing, you can come with those questions and we may not have the money to help fund your open access publication, but we understand the landscape mm -hmm. and can kind of give you some ideas for how to address that kind of situation. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay, so we... Was there anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to <laughs> like re-emphasize that like that like iterative process like start with one thing that you can change um and to make what you do open um and then like the next project just be like i'm gonna do two things now so yeah just keep chipping away yep. at that yep. yeah open is, is a spectrum not an yes, on-off switch exactly yeah another yep. qu quote by micah <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, well, thank you all for joining us. Um, we'll be back in August for another uh, reproducibility stream. Um, watch the library's website or our uh, social media for, uh, for updates. Thanks to our moderator, Claire. We so appreciate you and all the setup and time that you've put into this. Um, Please uh, reach out to us. Uh, we didn't introduce ourselves at the beginning. Yeah, I realized that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, our, our, the links are in the, uh, yeah. the GitHub repo, and uh, we're, we're easy to find online. Yeah. So thanks, Sheila. This is fun. Yeah, thanks, Lena. Yeah, all right. I'm going to stop Bye, the stream. Everybody. i got to walk over there. So <laughs> here we go. See you next time.